Good morning, Station Church. I'm Marie. And I'm Colin. If you're new here, stop by our welcome station in the lobby. While you're there, grab some coffee, snacks, and other treats on us. You can also grab a connection card to fill out so we can get to know you better and come and stop by and say hi in the lobby. To stay up to date with all things Station Church, please text JOIN to 760-307-4075. You can also download the Station app where you can watch past messages, look for upcoming events, and so much more. Here at the Station Church, we love to stay connected. For more on our connect groups, visit thestationchurch.com slash groups. If you have kids, be sure to check out the Kids Station, where they can learn about Jesus, have fun, have a safe time, while parents get to enjoy the message. For our high schoolers, we get together here at the Station Church at 6 p.m. on Wednesday nights. Have fun, bring a friend, and get together with our leaders, Jonah and Erica. At the end of each month, we host something called Pizza with the Pastor, where we have pizza, enjoy each other's company, you can learn about the mission of our church, and a little bit about our pastor. I'm Marie. And I'm Colin. This only took us 47 takes, and these... Wait. Yeah, just know, come in with, uh, with them on November. Okay, okay, okay. Thanks. All right. I'll do like a big pause, so... And these... I'm Marie. Okay. I'm Marie. And I'm Colin. This only took us 47 takes, and these are your November, November announcements. announcements. <laughs> Good morning, Station Church. How you guys feeling today? You're looking good. You're sounding good. My name's Josh. If we haven't had the privilege of meeting yet, I would love to meet you. I'll be hanging out in the lobby afterwards. We have this area called the Welcome Station, and we love giving free stuff away. There's coffee mugs. There's Bibles. There's notebooks. There's tote bags. We've got some books called Following Jesus. It's just some practical first steps on what it looks like to have a relationship with Jesus. If you haven't grabbed one of those yet, grab one of those. Oh, you know, I forgot to bring those with me. Mom, you're always my assistant. Give it up for my mom. Thank you. Thank you very much. We love giving free stuff away, and it is technically the cooler part of the year. I think we're going to be under 70 degrees today. So I got some Station Church beanies that I would love to throw at you. Who would want one of these? Natalie in the front row? I'm going to get that to you right there. Okay, now I've got only one left, and it's not tied up. So this one, I'm going to have to put a sack of batteries inside of. But uh, no, kidding. I don't know if I can go that far. I'm going to try to get right here. Right here. Ready? Uh, I need a little bit of participation. Can I get a... Whoa. We'll take it. I made it. And I pulled my arm out. No kidding. Uh, <laughs> we love giving free stuff away. Hey, if you're new and you're not on our email newsletter yet or you want to fill out a digital connection card, point your QR code. I'm getting to that one. Point your QR code at the screen and you can sign up for our email newsletter. Sign up to serve. Be baptized. We're going to do a baptism next month. So finally, uh, right here. In the auditorium, we have an inflatable jacuzzi, and we get the water warm and comfortable for you, and dunk you. So that's coming up in just a few weeks' time. Uh, I probably should throw the date at you. I forgot it, but I'll tell you next week. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's coming up soon. So you can sign up to be baptized if you would like. Hey, we got a lot going on. It's the holiday season, and this entire month of November is Foster Awareness Month. Last week we did an entire Q&A discussion about it, and there was an interest meeting, which I heard was fantastic. Anybody go to the interest meeting? There's nobody. Okay. Uh, just kidding. You guys went. And uh, what we're trying to do is just raise awareness about the foster community, and obviously it would be amazing if God puts on your heart to become a foster family and look after some little kids in your home. We know that is a, a tall ask, and so not everybody is called to do that. But uh, for many of us, we can support those who are doing that. You can be uh, a support in so many different ways by just providing food or just some re relief from, you know, child care. Maybe hang out with the kid, throw a ball in the yard for an hour, uh, pickups, drop-offs, anything. Uh, you can sign up just to help out those who are fostering. And so if you are interested in learning more about that, uh, you can stop by the lobby. There's an entire table called Foster the City and learn all the details about that. Also, what is already, I think it's, nope, it's about to be on the screen. We're doing something called Hope for the Holidays, and this is our opportunity to be a blessing to families in need, and so we've been asking you for the past couple weeks to prayerfully consider uh, buying a toy or perhaps two new toys um, and bring it before December 3rd is our, our cutoff date, and we're going to set up shop right here at church, 
and invite families in need, many of which will be foster families, and uh, allow them just to go shopping for free and pick out some toys for uh, putting under the Christmas tree. And so that all kids around this community have some presents to open. That sounds like a good thing to do. Amen. So if you would like to be generous, there's all kinds of cards in the lobby. You can pick what gender and what age group you want to purchase for or uh, more than one if you're if you're feeling generous. So that's going to be uh, a great opportunity. Also, um, I've been asked to ask you if you want to help serve to put that on. That's going to be December 8th, which is a Saturday. Is that right? December 8th, 9th. That was a test. You passed. Good job. And uh, <laughs> December 9th, and it's going to be a Saturday right here at church. And if you can come for an hour or two or three, great. If you want to stay the entire, you know, six hours for set up and tear down, that's awesome. As little or as much as you want. But there's a sign-up sheet if you'd like to volunteer for that. It's going to take several people, obviously, to pull this off. And then last but not least, we have another serving opportunity. It's just a good time of year to be serving, right? It's a good time of year to be giving back, to be doing good in the community. And we love partnering with our friends at Philabelli, and they just every week consistently are providing food for our friends experiencing homelessness, and it's happening again this Tuesday, and the Station Church is bringing Thanksgiving. And so I think all the food items are already spoken for, so unless you want to just bring more, but um, there's always uh, areas to serve and, and just really sit down and connect with people, hear their stories, pray with them, and it's a really practical way to be Jesus' hands and feet in our community. So that's going to be this Tuesday, Holiday Park. I believe it starts at 6, but show-up time is... Six, and um, you're passing all the tests today, Linda. And uh, I think it's already going to be dark by six. It's that time of year. Yay for daylight savings time. So bring a flashlight if you want. The park is well lit, but the walk you know, there, if you've been there, is a little uh, on the darker side. So that's going to be amazing. Last announcement, and you've made it through the announcement portion, is uh, we like to give back to God and in the area of our finances. And I feel like this always, always rubs somebody the wrong way because there's always some people who are holding tightly to giving to God and trusting in this area. I want to encourage you with this verse. Proverbs 11.24 says, one gives freely yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. There's this biblical principle that he who sows reaps, and he who withholds just kind of grows poorer and poorer. You think the anti, you, you think the, the the equation to you know getting richer and richer would be to hold on to what you have. That's called our flesh. Our carnality wants to just hold it. If I just build up a big enough savings account, and then and then then I'll be I'll have you know safety and security until the stock market takes it all away, or until something and you, happens in the world. And Jesus teaches this opposite principle. He says, "No, the more you give, the more I'm able to give to you. The more I'm able to pour on you." And that goes against our our logic, right? Because you're like, that doesn't make sense. And he's like, exactly. <laughs> And so many things in the Bible and our faith are counterintuitive because it requires us taking a step of faith. That's a risk. But I believe God, when he sees a generous heart, when he, when he sees somebody who calls themselves a Jesus follower, say, you know what, God, everything I have comes from you, and so freely I give. He goes, now that's the life I can bless. That's the life I can continue to pour out seed on because I know they're not going to just hoard it for themselves. They're going to sow it. They're going to plant it. And so if you haven't experienced this in your life yet, uh, um, years ago, I would never talk about tithing because I don't like talking about money. And God kind of rebuked me pretty strongly and said, you need to teach on this. You need to educate because people don't understand. So every week we try to share just a little verse on that so that if you are not yet a giver and experiencing generosity back from God, this is how. The antidote to materialism and greed is generosity. And so we, we encourage you to be generous and uh, to others, to your community, to your family, of course, and to God and his church. If you would like to give, all the ways are on the screen, Venmo, app, website. There's envelopes in the back of your chairs, all the rest. There's all kinds of ways. So thank you for your generosity, and it is going to build this house. Which, by the way, uh, if you haven't peeked in what we call Theater 4 yet, we are turning it into a youth center. There's been some great progress recently. we got primer up on the walls, and one of the walls has got a first coat of blue, and you see all this kind of visible change now. A lot of it's been kind of structural, you don't see, so... Pop your head in there. It's coming along nicely, and uh, it's going to be a great space, almost 2,000 square feet for teenagers to run around and do what teenagers do. I don't know. 
I forgot. It's been too long. Any teenagers in the house, in the, in the building? No. At heart, I love it. I love it. Never grow up. Uh, <laughs> me too. I'm 18. Um, anyway, moving along to serious things. Hey, you guys are in for such a treat today. Uh, we have a guest speaker who is not really a guest because he is part of this house. And I had the privilege of going over his notes. And so I know how good it's going to be. This is going to bless you. And I encourage you to open up your hearts and your ears to hear from God as he speaks through Thaddeus today. Would you put your hands together as we welcome Thaddeus Tag to the stage? Hey, Station Church. Uh, I am so grateful and proud to call this church my home, and uh, this church has just blessed me so much, um, so I'm really excited. Um, there's two ways that this morning could go. The first is that I'm able to um, teach God's word and people are blessed, and the second is that I make Pastor Josh look really good. There's a lot of power in this microphone. So yeah, I, I'm okay with it going either way. Um, no. Um, so today we're going to be ta uh, talking about the story of Jacob wrestling with God from Genesis 32. Um, this is something that's been very near and dear to my heart, and I just have a lot on my heart that I would like to share. Um, so if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Genesis 32, um, verses 22 through 32. If not, um, just go ahead and pull your phone out, download the Bible app. You can probably finish downloading it by the time that we get to it. Um, okay. Uh, I'm just going to launch in because I have a lot to share. Uh, okay, so let's read the story, and then, then we'll talk about it. Uh, Genesis 32, verses 22 through 32. But during the night, he, and he meaning Jacob, got up and took his two wives and his two maidservants and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He got them safely across the brook along with all his possessions. But Jacob stayed behind by himself, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he couldn't get the best of Jacob as they wrestled, he deliberately threw Jacob's hip out of joint. The man said, let me go, it's daybreak. Jacob said, I'm not letting you go till you bless me. The man said, what's your name? He answered, Jacob. The man said, but no longer, your name is no longer Jacob. From now on, it's Israel, God wrestler. You've wrestled with God and you've come through. And Jacob asked, what's your name? And the man said, why do you need to know my name? And then right then and there, he blessed Jacob, or he blessed him. Jacob named the place Peniel, God's face, because he said, I saw God face to face and lived to tell the story. The sun came up and he left Peniel limping because of his hip. This is why Israelites to this day don't eat the hip muscle because Jacob's hip was thrown out of joint. Okay. Um, so we're going to spend a little bit of time breaking down the story, some really interesting things I love about the story, and then we're going to talk a little bit more personally. But before we do, I want to give a little bit of context about Jacob and about his life because it'll, it'll – you know, kind of pay forward into um, the story as we, you know, dissect it. So Jacob is born uh, a twin, and he comes out gripping the heel of his older brother Esau. And pretty much from that point, you can see he lives his whole life that way. He kind of plays second fiddle. He's the second born. Um, he kind of has a chip on his shoulder. And because of that, he grows up, the Bible tells us, to be kind of a con man. He manipulates people. He gets what he wants. His, his older brother is a manly man, real strong, and Jacob's kind of a more, more subversive, more manipulative. And he basically cons his dad into rewriting the will. He manipulates his own father into rewriting the family will, giving the blessing to him instead of to his older brother Esau, who should have gotten it. And his older brother was a, a strong, violent man. So he goes, okay, basically now I have to kill you because of what you did. So Jacob goes, great, and he runs, runs to family all the way across the other end of the nation, his uncle, his mom's brother, uh, Laban. And Laban has two very beautiful daughters, and Jacob falls in love with one of them. And he asks Laban, could I get your blessing? Again, see, he's searching for a blessing. He got his dad's blessing, now he's searching for Laban's blessing. Could I get a blessing, uh, your blessing to marry your daughter if I work for you for seven years? And Laban goes, free labor for seven years? Absolutely. So he says, sure. And then the wedding night comes, seven years go by real fast. The wedding night comes, and Laban gets Jacob drunk and switches the daughters out. And so basically Jacob marries the wrong daughter. He wakes up, finds out he's married to the wrong daughter. And Laban goes, I'll give you the right daughter for another seven years. So you'll be married to both my daughters. He cons the con man or manipulates Jacob 
into uh, free labor, basically exploits him. So then God, the, the Bible says God basically blesses everything Jacob does. He's a, he's a farm hand. He's a, a, a ranch hand. He's, he tends to livestock. No matter what he does, he's di digging ditches, literally he's digging wells, and he's more blessed than Laban's servants. And Laban sees this, and at every point along the story, Laban exploits Jacob, at every point. So Jacob can't stand it any longer, and he goes, I'm leaving. He takes off, and this is where our story picks up. He doesn't know where he's going, and Laban, he leaves in the dead of night, and Laban goes, oh, I'm not going to let my prized servant leave, Jacob, because that's how Laban viewed Jacob, essentially. And he hunts him down, he rides him down, and basically Jacob's wives convince Laban not to kill them all. And Laban goes, okay, so he goes home. So now they're like wandering aimlessly as a family. They don't know where they're going, and a scout shows up, and he comes to David's family, I mean, sorry, to, to Jacob's family, and he goes, look, you remember that brother that you had, the, the real violent one? He's got 400 armed men, and they're coming your way. And I don't think we can really guess as to his intentions. I think we know what they are. And so Jacob goes, okay, so he sends his, his family on ahead of him. He sends his livestock. He sends his servants as gifts saying, you know, ask for forgiveness. Try to get Esau to, to turn away. And they hear nothing back, and they hear nothing back, and they hear nothing back. And so Jacob's trapped. He sent, he's done everything he can. He's manipulated everybody he can to this point. So he sends his family across the river. He sits down at the fire, and he plans, as, as he probably has his whole life. He's trapped between 20 years of exploitation in his past and 400 armed men coming to kill him and his family. That's all he knows. All he knows is how to try to get out of this. And out of the shadow, the Bible tells us, comes a man. And, you know, later in the story, Jacob says, I saw the face of God. So it's very obvious this is God. But this is what scholars call, if you're Bible students, what scholars call a Christophany. A Christophany is an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. And it happens in four places. Um, not in order, but it happens in uh, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire with the fourth man. It happens with Joshua and the commander of heaven's armies. It happens with Melchizedek and Abraham when he uh, goes to Jerusalem. And then it happens here in this story. This is an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. And I think we'll find out why. So this is the scene. They wrestle for what the Bible, we assume, based on the text, is eight hours. For, till daybreak, from night till daybreak, they wrestle. So this is where we pick up. So obviously, this story is going to be about Jacob wrestling with God and about us wrestling with God, right? But before we get to like what is wrestling and, and the story, I wanted to kind of define it because I think a lot of us can say that we wrestle with God or think that we wrestle with God. Um, we're in reality, we're just angry with him, Right? Like, I hear, I have a lot of friends that I talk with, and they go, man, I'm really just wrestling with God. And in reality, they're just expressing their anger at God. And, and make no mistake, that's okay. God wants that. God wants you to express your anger at him. But that's not wrestling. If I go to someone and I just tell them off, I'm not wrestling with them, right? Like, wrestling, and this is how I would define it. Wrestling is when you tell God something, or God tells you something, and then you or him have the opposite to say. So it's when one of you says something and the other person says no. <laughs> and then you're at, you know, then you're in an argument. That's wrestling. An argument is closer to wrestling than anger is, right? So that's how I'm going to define it. When you think about wrestling in your life, when you're saying something or when God's saying something and the other is saying the exact opposite and then you go, what's next? I think this text will tell us. Okay, so a couple of really cool things I want to tease out of this story before we, we jump into kind of what it is for us. I think first and foremost in what happens in this story is God wanted to strip Jacob of his independence. Jacob had been operating independently as a con man his entire life. And in fact, it was all he knew. It, God used it to bless Laban, to bless his family. God expanded Jacob's family as, even though he was operating kind of as a manipulator, right? Um, but we see in the story that he's fighting God for hours and hours. And then the moment that God throws his hip out of place, Jacob understands who he is, who God is. And he goes from fighting God to fighting to hold on to God. He goes from battling God to when he finally realizes this is God, the, he, he grabs on to God's foot. The way, and, and the text is, is a callback to Jacob's birth when he was gripping the heel of Esau. He was gripping the heel of man, and now he's gripping the heel of God. And God's going, let me go. And he's going, I won't let you go till you bless me. I'm fighting with everything I have. I'm fighting from a place of weakness to keep you, to hold on to you, because I finally know that I have it. 
So I think also God wanted to show Jacob that his whole life he had been wrestling man. He had been wrestling Esau. He had been searching for the blessing of man. But what he really had wanted was the blessing of God. His whole life he had been trying to manipulate people into giving them their blessing. He manipulated his dad. He thought he manipulated Laban. And he was searching for the blessing. He he felt empty inside. This is what he wanted desperately. And that wasn't going to fill the God-sized hole in his heart. So he thought he had been wrestling Esau. He really had to wrestle God. And so after this wrestling match, God says, I'm going to name you Israel, which means God wrestler. And we know the name Israel because of the nation of Israel, right? So think about it this way. God's like, I'm going to name you, and I'm going to name my entire nation the God wrestlers. Like, what does that mean? Like, what does it mean? And this is a Tim, Tim Keller quote. What does it mean that God is first and foremost a wrestler? Like, we treat God like he's this, and, and I do this too. We go into prayer and we bow down and we treat him like he's an emperor on a throne. And he's really a wrestling coach in a leotard. Like, <laughs> like, like we treat him like, like, please, would you answer this prayer? Please, we are so mighty. We worship you. You're holy. And he's like, I'm waiting for you to get in and, and practice. Like, I'm waiting, for you to, I'm waiting for you to wrestle with me, what I really want. Uh, I just think it's funny that God's whole, his whole children, all of the nation of Israel is named, literally named the God wrestlers. Like, think about that. What if you named your kid, like, what if I named my kid the Thaddeus wrestler? Like, like that, would, that, would be, that would just be weird. So I think it's interesting that the name Israel is God wrestler. What does that mean about God's nature? Also, I think it's interesting that we treat God like an emperor, We bow down, and he's on his thousand-mile throne. But then we are surprised when he doesn't answer. If you treat God like an emperor that would never answer you, why are you surprised when he doesn't answer you? If you want God to answer you, treat him like a father that will answer you. If you want want God to get up in the middle of the night at 3 a.m. and get you a cold glass of water, treat him like a dad that would do that. Right? Okay. That's just, that's an aside. (laughs) Okay. Um, So Jacob says um, two things. After eight hours of wrestling, Jacob says two things. Now, if you've ever wrestled for an extended period of time, you know that words don't come easy, right? So he says two things, and I think it's really important to own in, to to zero in on those two things because I think they're meaningful in the text. So the first thing he says is, who are you? And the text is, it's sarcastic in the text because he's, he knows who it is, but he's like, who are you? But he knows the answer because God turns around and goes, what do you mean, who am I? Like, He's like, what do you mean? Why are you asking who I am? He knows this. So he's confirming the identity of God. He's asking it. And then this is, the, this is one of the most important things, I think, of this story. If you leave here with nothing, hang on to this. He says, in Hebrew, he says, I will hold on to you until I die. And, and the actual phrasing is, I won't let go. Unless you bless me, I will die. And that means two things. The first and foremost is he's saying, I'm going to hold on to you until you bless me. The only way to get me off of you is to kill me. And you're not going to kill me, so you better bless me. But it has a double meaning in Hebrew because what he, what he said was, if I let go and you don't bless me, I can't live the rest of my life without your blessing. I have been living my whole life without your blessing. And it's been ruin and death and I need your blessing if I'm going to live any kind of true life from here on out. And so he's saying, he's saying, go ahead, try to make me let go. I'll die before I let go. But then on the other hand, he's saying, I, I can't live without your blessing. I will die. And I think that's really important because he's finally realized what he's been searching for his whole life. He finally realized where where his life is headed, what he needs, what's been resting inside of his heart. He finally saw his whole life in, in retrospect, and he saw that he, he hasn't been able to get the blessing of man. And, and when he has gotten, it's been nothing but ruin. It's been nothing but, you know, a, a, a vapor. And when he finally finds God, and he has God in the flesh, he goes, I'm not going to lose this. That's gonna, we're going to talk about that a little bit more later. Um, and the last thing I want to say is I think it's interesting that the Bible doesn't tell us God's blessing of Jacob. I think it's interesting that it just says there and then he blessed him. And what, what I take away from that is that the, the blessing that Jacob had been yearning for was so personal and so tender and so secret that the Bible kept it that way. 
that what was on Jacob's heart was so personal and, and so deep in him that God honored that by keeping it private. And God's gonna treat us the same way. What we're looking for is so personal and so tender and so unique to each of us because he crafted each of us uniquely that it, it's gonna be, God's gonna know what it is and he's gonna give it to you. And it's gonna be personal and unique based on what the desire of your heart is, right? Okay, so let's talk about one other thing real quick that's gonna lead into how we apply this. I don't think God's plan was to wrestle Jacob. I think his plan all along was to bless him. But he knew that if Jacob didn't know what he needed, he wouldn't accept the blessing, right? Jacob was like, I've been looking for the blessing of man this whole time, and I'm going to con my way out of this sandwich between the past of exploitation and my brother's troops. And God was going, no, you're searching for the blessing of God. You always have been, except you just don't know it. And I have to make you see it before you're going to accept the blessing. And once you see it, then you're going to want my blessing more than you want anything else in your whole life. And so I don't, the God's plan was to bless Jacob all along from the beginning. But he knew that it was going to take an eight-hour wrestling match to get him there. We're going to come back to that. But um, what's the point of that? The point is honesty. We have to be rigorously honest, rigorously honest with ourselves about what we want and why we want it. Jesus said in the gospel, in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he, um, he says this line to the Pharisees. He says, the human traffickers and the prostitutes will get into the kingdom of heaven before the Pharisees do. And let me translate that into modern English. In modern English, that, that would be the equivalent of Jesus saying, the LGBTQ community will get into the kingdom of heaven before the pastors of North County will. That doesn't make any sense. And Jesus said it not because the, the human traffickers and the prostitutes were morally superior to the Pharisees. He said it because they were broken and living in their brokenness, whereas the Pharisees were broken and lying to everyone and pretending like they weren't, right? So he's saying it because he goes, they're broken and they know it. They're not lying to me. And the Pharisees are broken and they're pretending like they're going to get into heaven easy. So the point is honesty. God wants you to be rigorously honest with yourself. What do you want? What is the deep desire of your heart? And why are you asking for it? Bring that to him, right? Bring that to him in all of its ugliness, in all of its hopelessness, in all of its desire, and he'll take care of it. Okay, so let's make a little bit of a switch. My question to you guys as we kind of make this switch is, what is that desire in your heart? What are you holding on to? What prayer requests have you stopped praying? What prayer requests have you never started praying because you're afraid that it will never get answered or because you don't think, quote unquote, God works that way, right? As we keep going, I think it'll become more clear for each of us as we sit in this, maybe what those are. Um, there's a great uh, uh, mental health kind of um, professional that I follow on social media. His name is Jay Stringer. And he said something really interesting. He said, you know, in Southern California, we all kind of grow up affluent and um, we understand what it's like um, to, to grow up in a, a wonderful place on earth with the weather and, you know, um, just so much at our fingertips. And we use that as an excuse to minimize the amount of pain that we felt in our lives. We say, well, um, I grew up in a great area of town. I had two parents or I had, you know, my parents were divorced. I had one parent, they were loving. It, that's just the way it was. I, you know, I experienced my fair share of bad stuff, but it wasn't that bad. Instead of acknowledging the truth that even though every single person in this room um, has grown up in this affluent area of the world, we all know what it's like to be ruined at some point in our life. And that could be very small. That could be a breakup. That could be um, a family member passing away. That could be losing a job. That could be an illness. Bad news, right? We, you can be the richest person in the world with no trauma in your life, and yet you still know what it's like to be ruined. Ruin is not, um, ruin is personalized to each of us, right? And admitting that Admitting that you felt that ruin and that pain, I think, opens the door, just cracks it open to the desires that you have in your heart that maybe you haven't brought to God, right? Pain is one of the ways we can backtrack and backwards map where our desire is. Where we felt the most amount of pain in our life is a, is a thread to where we have felt the most desire. I think that's going to be really key going forward. Okay, um, 
The kind of honesty that I'm looking for is the kind of honesty that Job showed. In Job 5, Job says to his friends, I uh, would not trust God with a thousand prayers because he wouldn't answer a single one. And when God comes down at the end of the book, he looks at Job's friends and he says, you guys spoke poorly of me and you need to offer sacrifices. Job, in all of your anger, you did not speak dishonestly or disrespectfully of me. At the end of Psalm 66, uh, it's called the cry of Heman. The author, who we think is Heman, says that the darkness before death would be better than living a life where God is present but does not answer my prayers. The last word in Hebrew of that psalm is darkness. Like, church, could we have that kind of honesty? The kind of honesty that is, that is willing to bring our worst days to God and go, you know what? I didn't feel like you were there today. Dan Allender, in his book, To Be Told, he says something really interesting. He says, our pain and anger at God does not come from the fact that during our worst moments, God was not present. It comes from the fact that he was present and he did nothing. And you know what? I don't think God disagrees with us. I think he wants us to admit that. He goes, I'm not afraid of your feelings. God, God's not going up there like, man, that's, that's a scary feeling right there. Like, God doesn't show up for me. Wow, that's scary. No. Like, he wants us to come to him with all of our feelings, the worst of them, the most painful. So that would be my question as we kind of move through this. What are you holding on to? What desires and pain? What days did God show up but do nothing when you needed him? Bring those to God. Um, C.S. Lewis, the famous Christian author, wrote this book at the end of his life called Until We Have Faces. And after he wrote the book, he said, this is my best book. This is the best book I've ever written. And it's a retelling of the myth, of the Greek myth of Cupid and Psyche. And it's really insightful. So the, this book is about um, the main characters, Cupid and Psyche, and then uh, Psyche's younger sister, Orwal. And it's the the... the point of view, the main point of view is from Orwell, and she grows up under the kind of, um, you know, the kind of canopy of this story that's happening. And she's relatively unattractive, she just has a normal family, goes about normal life, but at key points in the book, she loses everything she loves. So first she loses her mentor, who, who's given her everything she knows, and then she loses her family, and then she loses her sister to this grave injustice that is happening, and this, no one can fix it. And so as she goes through her life, she keeps this log, this beautiful book, persuasive in its writing and in its aesthetic of how the gods have wronged her. And, and it's good. It's like good writing. It's good argumentation. And she just, man, she goes at it. And then at the end of the book, she actually gets an audience with the gods, the Greek pantheon. And they, they bring her up, and she pulls out this book, and instead of a book, it's turned into like a crumbling scroll. And she's like, well, I'm here, so I might as well read it. So she opens the scroll, and she reads it. And she reads all the grievances. And it's just silence from the gods. And she goes, okay, well, if they won't say anything, maybe I'll, maybe I'll read it again. So she goes through it again, and, and she goes through it again, and again. And the lead judge, he holds his hand up, and he says, all right, that's enough. And he says, he, he asks her one question. He goes, is the question that you came here for answered? And she looks down at the floor and she says, yes. And then C.S. Lewis writes one of the most impactful things I've ever read in my entire life. It's going to haunt me. In explaining the story, this is what he writes. When the time comes to you at which you will be forced at last to utter the speech which has lain at the center of your soul for years, which you have all that time, idiot-like, been saying over and over, you'll not talk about the joy of words. I saw well why the gods do not speak to us openly, nor let us answer. Till that word can be dug out of us, why should they hear the babble that we think we mean? How can they meet us face to face until we have faces? And what he means by that is how can you experience God in all of his splendor and glory unless you first know what lies in your own heart? If our heart is just a reflection of God, if our heart is just the summation of God's creation, he said, God said, this is my greatest creation, humans. If we don't understand what goes on in our, our own heart and what our own desires are, how are we going to understand or be able to hear God's answer when he does answer us? That's been really, it was really crucial for me to, to, as I was going through the story, to ponder that. How could Jacob have understood God's blessing, the intimate blessing that God gave him that the Bible doesn't list, if he did not first know what his true desire was? 
If he had been going after the blessing of man and he had thought that's what he wanted, then God's intimate blessing would have washed over him, would have been deaf to his ears. He would have, the beauty would have been lost on him. So you cannot experience and interact with God at a true intimate level until you first understand those deepest desires that you are wrestling for or that you think you're wrestling for. I think the process of wrestling will draw this out. So, um, one of the stories in the Gospels of Matthew really, um, actually, I think it's in all the Gospels, um, really st- struck me. And that's the story of the Syrophoenician woman. So Jesus and his disciples are going around the Sea of Galilee, and this woman comes up to him, and she asks him, hey, can you heal my daughter? And she's of Syrophoenician descent, which is a Gentile, right? And in the story, um, God says, quite callously, why should I give to the dogs what was meant for the children at the table? And what he's saying is, why should I heal the Gentiles when I came for the Jews? And she goes, yes, master, but don't the dogs even lick the scraps, stuff, the scraps off the ground that the children drop from the table? And he goes, I've never seen faith like this in all of Israel. And that story kind of struck hollow for me. Like, I didn't understand it until I really dug into it. So I was reading it in the Gospels, and basically this is what happens. And, and you can read this in the, in the story. She comes to Jesus, and the first thing it says is that Jesus ignored her. And then it says it again. Jesus ignored her when she continued coming. And then, then the disciples come to Jesus because they go, she's bugging us now. Like, could you take care of this just so she stops bugging us? And so Jesus brings her up and, and he says, I have, I have not seen faith like this in all of Israel. And I think what, what was interesting was that he wasn't trying to frustrate her. He was trying to test whether or not, why she was there. Because if she was there because he was a healer, then once he didn't heal, she would leave. But if she was there because he was the Messiah of the universe, then she was going to ask and ask and ask and ask and ask and ask and ask, knowing that he was a good Messiah and that he was going to follow through on his word. Right? So, what I would ask is when do you feel like Jesus has ignored you? When in your life have you felt ignored by God? Because sometimes we can present prayer requests And we can really mean them from our heart. But we're just going to God because he's kind of a cosmic vending machine, right? We're just punching in the prayer code and out comes the healing, out comes the prayer request, out comes the finances, whatever it is. Are you praying because God provides good things or are you praying because he's a Messiah and because he wants to give good things to his children? If you're praying because he's a Messiah, you're gonna keep praying because he's a a Messiah and he's a good Messiah who wants to give good things to his children. Okay, um, so how do we make this personal? Pastor Josh, when he and I were going back and forth about this, just constantly was challenging me, how can I make this personal for you guys? And I, I don't think I have a good answer except by way of just my own life, right? Just kind of showing you how this has really struck me. Um, so um, for as long as I can remember, from as young of an age as I can remember, I've always wanted to be a dad. And um, that's been one of the deepest desires of my heart. And in March of 2020, God blessed me by giving me a son. Through a series of circumstances, I would not go back and repeat. And ever since then, for like the last two years, my son's three and a half now, I've been in a really tough custody battle. And I've, I've struggled with this because I've been like, God, why did you give me this desire if I can only see my son once a week? Why did you give me this desire if I can't be his dad? Every day for me that I don't get to see him is extreme pain because I feel like a failure as a dad because my deepest desire is to be a dad. There's a story in the Gospels where a man comes up to Jesus and he says, um, uh, can I join your ministry? And Jesus says, yes. And he goes, but I, I need to go bury my father first. And in the Hebrew, it's not my dad just died, I need to go physically dig the hole. It's my dad's on his last legs and I have a responsibility to him because he has no one else. Once that responsibility is complete, then I can, I can join you. And Jesus says, let the dead bury their dead. And then he turns to the disciples and he says, um, if you value your father or mother over me, you don't deserve me. And then he says something interesting. He says, if you value your son or daughter over me, you don't deserve me. And that cut me because I realized in that moment that my whole life had become, had started revolving around this desire of being a dad. Everything I had been doing for the court to prove that I was a good dad, everything that I had been doing um, to prepare for the days that I was going to hang out with my son, everything I had been doing in my life, everything I talked about has started revolving around my son. And you know what, church? That's a good thing. 
We encourage that in dads. We encourage, like, be involved, be prepared, do everything you can, be proactive. But I realized that my identity was becoming it. Everything that I had started doing was around Thaddeus the dad, right? And Jesus will not brook any competitors. He won't compete with anyone. If you choose someone else over him, he'll let you. That's the sad part. However, if you're a Christian, I think he's going he's gonna to make you wrestle with it. Jesus says this in Matthew 16, 24 through 26. Then Jesus went to work on his disciples. Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way to finding yourself, your true self. What kind of deal is it if you get everything but you lose yourself? What could you ever trade your soul for? And I, I think that Jesus is starting to draw me on this path of understanding that, like, I've been searching, I've been wanting to be a father my whole life. But I've also been searching for a father. And he's the ultimate father. And, so, and, I, and I've swapped those two. I want to close with a, a scripture and then a story. I think the next kind of obvious question in our heads is if you don't know what the, the deep desire in your heart that you need to wrestle with God is, then you can start on that path and ask God what it is. If you do know what it is, probably many of us in this room are like, ah, I don't feel like I can trust God with that. And I want to read something from the book of Matthew, Matthew 5, 1 through 7 real quick. Because when I read this, I felt free to give my struggle as a dad to God. From the message translation, Matthew 5. When Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge, huge crowds, he climbed a hillside. Those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions. This is what he said. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. You're blessed when you feel that you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are, no more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink and the best meal you'll ever eat. You're blessed when you're full of care. At the moment of being careful, you find yourselves cared for. And when Jesus said in the story, when he said, if anyone prioritizes their, their daughter or son over me, they don't deserve me, he wasn't saying, you, you got to leave your son and daughter. He was saying, if you have to sacrifice the good to get to the best, then you know exactly what I have to go through in sacrificing my own son on the cross. If you have to sacrifice something amazing to get to me, then you will be rewarded beyond your wildest dreams. Because Peter then turns to him and he says, Jesus, we gave up everything for you. And he says, yes, and it will be returned in full to, to, to you when you get into heaven. And what he's saying is, is if you have to give it up, I'm, I, that means you're going to go through pain. But I know that pain and I know your desire in having to give it up. And so I'm going to give it back to you because I, you're, a good, you're a good child and I'm a good father and I give you good things. So this is, this is kind of, for me, the, the capstone at the end. I was thinking about this, and I, I just, like, added it to the end. So sorry, Pastor Josh. Um, I uh, got the rare opportunity of getting my son for a full five hours on a Saturday once. And um, it was about three weeks ago. And I uh, told him beforehand, he's in this phase right now where everything is about tigers. He was a tiger for Halloween. He has a tiger lovey. Like, he wants to go see a tiger at the safari park. I told him, we're going to go to the safari park. We're going to go see a real tiger. And uh, so through a kind of a series of events, um, his mom was like, oh, we got some plans, so you can only have three hours. You can't have five. And so I, I picked him up from the drop-off location. And as I was driving to the drop-off location, I was like, man, three hours, uh, you know, the pickup location is 40 minutes away from the safari park. So by the time we're done driving, we're not going to get more than like 50 minutes at the wild animal park by the time you get to the gate and parking and all that. I was like, man, ah, it's such a bummer. So, like, maybe we'll go to the trampoline park so we can get the full three hours of time, right? We'll get quality connection. That's what he really needs. And if I'm a good dad, I'm going to do what he really needs over what he wants. 
And so I, I, I get out of the car, and he runs to me, and I pick him up, and he, he's, like, talking, and it's, like, crazy. And I'm like, what's going on? And he's like, look, I have my tiger lovey. Mom, let me bring it because we're going to go see the real tiger. And, look, I have my tiger T-shirt on because we get to go see the real tiger. And I started to tell him, like, oh, buddy, we don't have enough time, like all those adult excuses. And I just saw the joy, just the first confusion and then the joy just drain right out of his little body like all that pent-up joy he had about going to see the tiger and show the tiger the solidarity of having a tiger love you and wearing a tiger t-shirt. Like, and I stopped myself right there as I saw the joy just drain out of him. I stopped it and I said, I said, you know what? Do you really want, do you, we're not gonna get that much time. Do you really wanna go see the tiger today or do you wanna go to the trampoline park? And like a little spark of joy just jumped back into his eye and he goes, yeah, I wanna go see the tiger. And so we drove probably faster than I should have and we got to the wild animal park and we went and saw the tiger and, you know, pressed our faces up against the dirty glass. And it was right there. It was like two tigers just inches away from us. And we got frozen lemonade and, you know, just milked every second we possibly could as we left, left the park to get back in the car. And I was, he was asleep in the backseat and I was driving. And I just was like, man, God, I could see the joy and the desire in his body. God can see that in you. You may not be able to express it to him, but he can see the desire in your heart and in your body when you choose to express it. And I think, I don't know, but I think that God is, he's just asking, he's not asking us to be perfect. He's asking us just to wear our tiger t-shirts. Like wear them, wear them and be, a, be and, and, and chance the fact that he may, he may say no. Like wear them and guess what? It, it may not happen. You may get hurt, but know that God is a good God and that he sees you and that he always will see you and that he is gonna give you what that desire is because guess what, guys? He placed that desire in you in the first place when he made you. Like, he created every single person in this room individually. He spent millions of hours outside of time and space crafting all of our DNA and you think he doesn't know the desire at the deepest part of your heart? His work is trying to get you to see it. And so that when you see it, he goes, I will give it to you because I'm a good God. Like, oh man, that hit me. So that's my, that's my takeaway. Wear your tiger t-shirts. <laughs> if you don't know what your tiger t-shirt is, maybe just ask, what is this desire that's deep on my heart, God? What's a desire that you have given me? What's the thing that hurts so bad I can't live without it? What's the thing that you cling to God and say, if you don't give it to me, the rest of my life isn't worth living? What's that to you? Ask God and he will reveal it to you. Whew. Man, sorry. <laughs> um, I, cannot, I cannot express in words how blessed I have been by the Station Church. And the chance to share a little bit of my heart with you guys is like, just, it's such a blessing to me. Um, I'm gonna close in prayer and invite the worship team back up and we can wrap up for today. Man, God, I am just shredded right now. <laughs> I'm so um, glad to be part of your church. I'm so glad to be a part of your word. I'm so glad to be a part of your people. I'm so glad, God, that I get to open my heart to you. I'm so glad that I get to, to be me around you. I'm so glad that you know my deepest desires. And you're not asking me to give them up. You're asking me to put you first. You're not asking us to stop caring. You're asking us to care more by, by inviting the one who, who created that care inside of us. God, I pray that whatever you have put on the hearts of this church, you would just you would blow it up times a hundred. That you would make everyone here aware of what that is. You would make them aware of the, the desires, the deep desires they carry in their body that they maybe don't know or maybe they do know. God, I pray that your spirit would work mightily in this church, would, would, would work mightily in the people that have showed up here today. And God, more than that, I pray that you would, you would work mightily in me, that you would continue to keep me honest and humble before you, that every day I would seek out the honesty that Job had the honesty that Heman had in Psalm 66, the honesty to say, you know what, God, I'm, I'm not feeling like it today. Because at that moment, the moment where I say, 
God, why have you forsaken me? I am united with Jesus when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The moment when we feel farthest from the Father is the moment we're united with the Son. He experienced it too. God, I pray this over your church. I pray this over myself. I pray this over the worship team, over this building. The honesty that brings us into your presence, into your holiness. Thank you, God. Thank you, thank you, thank you for life, for love, for desire, for caring too much. Thank you for tears and for pain. We love you, God. We love you so much it hurts. We pray this by the name, by the blood, by the power and the majesty of the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
so incredible to worship with you. Beautiful message, sir. It's so good to have you. Thanks for gripping that word today. I would just say, let's make sure we keep God first this week. All aspects of our life and our jobs and our house and our families. Love you guys. So good to see you guys. Have a good afternoon, and we'll see you next week. I hear the sound. I hear the sound. I hear the sound.